The panelists take their seat, I just want to say two words about another class of species in Wyoming that we care a lot about. We've been talking about things that fly, and I want to um, just briefly touch on uh, what we know about wind impacts to ungulate species, and the answer is not much. Um, you can see this is sort of a uh, the full list of studies that are peer reviewed and published on wind energy impacts to, to unyielded species. Most of that work has been done on reindeer in Norway and Sweden. Not clear how useful that is to us, but let me click through some summary ideas from these studies. So, from those um, the studies on reindeer in Europe, um, researchers noted that. Um, there was some uh, avoidance of wind facilities by reindeer during the construction phase of the facilities, and that was during my, uh, my migratory behavior and in the calving seasons. For at least one study that followed populations during the operations phase, habitat use returned to normal um, following construction and now in the operations phase. As far as elk, we have one study in North America on wind energy impacts to elk. This comes with some, some caveats. The researchers were looking at uh, potential impacts to nutrition for elk and, um, and found no impacts of wind facilities to elk nutrition. This is a pretty small sample size of about 10 elk. Uh, and these, this population was subsidized with a nearby crop of winter wheat, which probably complicated some of the findings. We have exactly one study of uh, wind impacts to pronghorn that found um, no impact to adult female survival. Um, and that, unfortunately, didn't have pre-development data. We don't have any published studies on uh, wind and mule deer. And uh, we do know that um, mule deer are fairly sensitive to energy infrastructure, including oil and gas development. And that they don't tend to habituate to that development with time. So this is a, a species that we should um, watch in the, the coming years. With that, I want to turn to this really interesting panel that we have assembled here. Tabor Allison is back to facilitate it, and I'll ask Tabor to um, introduce the panelists that we have. So thanks, Tabor. Thank you, Nicole. Um, welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, very grateful to have another opportunity to talk with you again about uh, wind and wildlife uh, and wind energy in Wyoming. Um, our, the topic for this panel is environmental trade-offs of wind energy development local to global. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, to frame that conversation uh, shortly, um, but broadly what we're talking about is uh, looking at the trade-off uh, under the assumption that there are environmental benefits of wind energy development and there are also environmental impacts of wind energy development, just as there are impacts from all uh, sources of energy. And so, you know, an important premise is that we're going to get our electricity from somewhere. And the question with respect to wind energy development is, uh, given the benefits of wind energy, what are the trade-offs associated with impacts to wildlife, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. What I'd like to do first is introduce um, our panelists, um, and the, the way this session is going to work is that um, we'll have a conversation like many of the panels that you've seen uh, yesterday, uh, very interesting panels, and then uh, with about a half hour to go, we'll open up the floor for questions from you that uh, you can address directly to the panelists. Um, so first, uh, of course, Ember, uh, you all know from her excellent presentation from just shortly before. Uh, she's still at the University of Wyoming. She was this morning, so I won't uh, introduce her anymore. I'd like to introduce the other panelists, Allison. Uh, Halloran, uh, who is the executive director of the Audubon uh, Rockies, uh, who received did her undergraduate graduate work at the University of Wyoming, 
uh, and is focused on the potential effects of uh, during her graduate work on uh, oil and gas development. Thanks, on Sage Grouse in Pine Gale Mesa. Uh, Allison has been with Audubon for about seven years, 17 years. Prior to that, she did uh, a tour with the Peace Corps. Um, Connie uh, is a Wyoming native. Uh, Connie Wilbur, a Wyoming native, uh, has lived in Laramie since the 80s. She's been the chapter director of the Wyoming chapter of Sierra Club for the past seven years. Uh, previously, she worked for Wyoming Game and Fish as a habitat biologist and for the Wyoming Energy Council on Residential Energy Efficiency Programs. And then finally, uh, we have Dave Young from uh, West Inc. Uh, Dave is the uh, Chief Executive Officer. Dave has been working with West since 1992 uh, and is based in Cheyenne, which I assume is okay. Uh, and his specialty includes working with threatened and endangered species and wind power research. And Dave's uh, wind power work uh, includes 22 years of experience conducting avian and bat research at wind projects throughout North America. So I have a great uh, group up here, uh, diverse experience and perspectives. So, um, what when, uh, what I want to do next is just frame the panel and then uh, ask the panelists to respond and uh, I'll have some specific questions for them. Uh, so what we heard earlier uh, in the first session was uh, a review of what we know about the impacts of wind energy on wildlife. And what we also heard were uh, the uncertainties around those impacts. Uh, and there's a substantial amount of uncertainty. Uh, we have learned a lot, we continue to learn a lot, and yet there is still uncertainty about, uh, you know, what are the population level consequences of collisions to birds and wind facilities. We know a little bit more than we did a few years ago about impacts uh, to greater sage grouse, for example but there's still some uncertainty about uh, the extent of those impacts and ultimately uh, the consequences to sage-grouse, uh, sustaining uh, sage-grouse populations. There, we also heard uh, about uh, the impacts of climate change, uh, not just on Wyoming, but uh, globally. This is, of course, a, a major concern and um, there is some substantial risk of uh, continuing to uh, produce electricity from uh, fossil fuels uh, on uh, the, both the climate and uh, how species will respond to that uh, warming climate. And we also heard from Ember that there's some uncertainty associated with that. There are also other benefits of wind energy development that we haven't talked about. Um, uh, wind energy produces electricity uh, with uh, no air pollution, no uh, nitrous oxides or sulfur oxides, which are known to have uh, uh, effects on human health. Uh, no water is consumed in uh, the course of producing electricity from wind. Uh, water withdrawals from uh, thermally produced electricity, and I'm talking about, uh, now we're talking about uh, oil and gas and natural uh, coal plants and nuclear plants, uh, water withdrawals uh, from, to produce electricity at thermal power plants is uh, one of the greatest sources of water withdrawals uh, and water uses in, in the country. Uh, so there are other benefits associated with wind. So, uh, what I'd like the panel to, to talk about is, um, you know, given the benefits of wind, and there are some uncertainties associated with that, but also uh, given the impacts of wind and the uncertainties associated uh, around impacts to wildlife, 
uh, research is underway to try to reduce uh, those uncertainties, but uh, as we heard from Ember, uh, the pace and scale at which we reduce carbon emissions is going to have uh, substantial implications for the impacts of climate change. Uh, and so, uh, you know, to the ex extent that uncertainty uh, can be a factor in uh, the development of wind energy. The question, uh, you know, it's a two-part question, to what extent or how, uh, and I'm talking, uh, looking particularly at Allison and Connie, how do your organizations think about uh, managing or uh, working with the uncertainty impacts to wildlife with the looming threat of climate change? Uh, and how much uncertainty on impacts to wildlife uh, are we willing to accept in order to have the benefits of wind energy development? And in particular, how does your, uh, the, the level of uncertainty that you're willing to accept affected by future projections of climate change impacts on wildlife? And I'm talking about Ember's projections of a 2C world uh, at the end of this century versus a 4C world and the implications that that has. So, Allison, um, you know, if you kind of pitched it in, you know, how Audubon, Rockies, and beyond thinks about this. Um, sure. Thank you, Tabor. Uh, Audubon Rockies is a regional office of the National Audubon Society. And the National Audubon Society um, has taken a, a, a very strong stance and a position on wind development. And before I kind of tell you what Audubon's position is, I'd like to give you a little bit of background that, in context, that brought us to that position. Um, the National Audubon Science Team has put together a birds and climate change report. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, what we did was look at 580 North American land bird species. We took breeding bird surveys as well as Christmas bird count data over the past 30 years. And then projected not habitat data, but specifically climate data, so think temperature, precipitation, and things like that and model that out in three different scenarios. What it's going to look like in 2020, 2050, and 2080 for those 588 land bird species. Looking into Canada, into the US, we didn't do it for Mexico and the Southern Climes just because the data wasn't there, the bird data wasn't there to support that. And the bottom line is it looks pretty darn dire for our bird species. Of those 588, 314 are going are projected to lose at least half of their current range by 2080. So obviously, from Audubon standpoint, being a bird conservation organization, and I think you you've heard you know from a, a, a lot of the talks this morning and yesterday, um, there are huge impacts to birds and wind, but there are huge impacts to birds and climate, obviously. So we were kind of at this very strange position of, okay, climate change is one of the number one threats <coughs> to birds. We realize that. Um, it is a huge issue for Audubon, and we need to um, move that forward and, and address climate change quickly. Um, but we also, on the flip side, when it comes specifically to energy development, how do we handle that in the renewable resources sector? Because there are impacts, I think we can all say that. We, there's a level of uncertainty, there's a level of unknown, but what we do know is that you know, birds are heavily, birds and bats are heavily affected, <coughs> um, particularly in wind development. Um, but given the critical juncture that we are with climate change and what our models are predicting, and what all the other scientific data is telling us is we have to move forward and we have to move forward quickly. Otherwise, um, we're looking at a, a, a world of hurt, not only for birds, but for us as well. So given all that information, um, I'm going to, it's a very short statement and I'll, I'll kind of explain it afterwards. Um, our position on wind is Audubon strongly supports. 
properly cited wind power as a renewable energy source that helps reduce the threats posed to birds and people by climate change. However, we also advocate that wind power facilities should be planned, cited, and operated in ways that minimize harm to birds and other wildlife, and we advocate that wildlife agencies should ensure strong enforcement of laws that protect birds and other wildlife. So we really had to straddle that. Yes, we support wind development. Yes, we support renewable energy. But as Holly Copeland talked earlier and all the good work that TNC has done, the first thing we look at is siting. Where can we avoid, number one, and then go into mitigation. Um, avoidance is the, the number one priority. And strictly enforce the laws that now stand today. Um, so that's where Audubon stands as far as our stance on wind. I can, I think I'll save some other comments that I have for later of you know where we're going in the future and how we see um, engaging um, in the wind community and when it comes to mitigation and reclamation and the impacts that we're certainly going to see on our bird populations as these wind farms come online. So um, thank you all very much for being here and uh, participating in this great discussion that we've heard yesterday and today. Um, I am with the Sierra Club and I have been involved with the Sierra Club for many, many years. Uh, and my engagement is a little bit of a description of this, uh, this how the Sierra Club is structured and how that informs our um, position on this complex issue. Um, basically, the Sierra Club is a little bit different than a lot of other national um, environmental and conservation organizations in that um, we are really one organization from the very, very local level up to the national and even international level. And that uh, really, uh, it, puts us in a slightly different position in that our national level uh, position on this issue, which we've been engaged in for 20 plus years and increasingly recognizing the threat that uh, carbon pollution and climate change um, poses to all of the things that are important to my organization is, I, I'm glad that Tamer brought up in the introduction, the impacts of climate change and the potential benefits of renewable energy development and wind development on not just wildlife, but also many human endeavors across the board, human health and uh, the, the health and, and safety of our communities um, and all of those other issues, all of those issues are issues that the Sierra Club is deeply involved in and we can't really separate out the wildlife question. I can't and my organization can't. So um, we do support, strongly support the, the development of renewable energy and wind energy in particular um, and we believe that we need to um, move in that direction as quickly as possible. We understand the many trade-offs that are involved in this, and this comes back to our interesting structure where um, at the local level, we have lots of, of people who are involved with the Sierra Club, both volunteers and staff, who are deeply concerned about very specific local impacts, and I would say, I would consider Wyoming in that context, that we have folks here who are very, very um, protective of our Wyoming values, our wildlife values, our open spaces, our way of life here, and yet from that larger perspective, we are absolutely committed to uh, implementing renewable energy and development of renewable energy as quickly as possible um, because what if we don't, the known risks and the increasingly clear risks of not changing our energy, where we get our energy from, 
overshadows our concern for wildlife. We can't have healthy wildlife if we don't deal with, with climate change and attempt to uh, change our, the way that we use and produce energy as quickly as possible. So that's kind of the overview of, of where my organization is coming from and that struggle that we have internally um, trying to balance our the, the local interests that are extremely important on the ground and it's not just Wyoming, it's pretty much everywhere that, that people live, the places they love and the that their local values are the most important to them. And so we're having that, um, trying to find that balance, and as Allison said, navigate our way through this so that we can get where we know we need to go while minimizing the impacts on our local, uh, our local resources and values. Yeah, thank you. So that was a really nice uh, juxtaposition of the local challenge and the global challenge uh, and uh, a few years back I wrote a paper with a couple of other uh, scientists and it was uh, the title was thinking globally and signing locally so you know it's these decisions of where a project is going are, are made locally and uh, looking at the local impacts and the pace and scale at which these local decisions are made have global implications. Uh, so Ember, you touched on this briefly in your uh, presentation about the various paths. And um, in order, you know, what uh, can you tell us about uh, the amount of wind energy, the, the build out, if you will, that would be needed to contribute uh, substantially to achieving some of these paths where we're reducing emissions and limiting uh, change, uh, temperature change to say two degrees. So I'll kind of recap a little bit about um, what I showed in the presentation. So, so right now um, we're sitting at about one degree of warming compared to pre-industrial levels. That's across the globe, the global average. And I, I would point out that when you look at global averages, that subsumes a whole lot of information about the global averages, right? So this is, we're talking the entire planet. Um, so, so we're at one degree of warming right now compared to pre-industrial levels. Um, we're on, if you remember back to the, the presentation, um, there were sort of the, the four emissions pathways that I talked about, which are called resource concentration pathways. Um, they're just emission scenarios. So, so basically, we're on track for that, that red line that's considered a high emissions line. That's business as usual, basically no additional mitigation. And within that range, we're looking at probably, projections differ, but we're looking at probably something around a four degree, maybe up to six or seven degree amount of warming by 2100. And then there were those other sort of pathways um, that kept us at three degrees, I think I emphasized in the presentation, and then at the two degree mark. So specific to, to what proportion of mitigation effort comes from upscale and low carbon energy resources, I think that can sort of be traded around in terms of solar or wind, but overall we're looking at some very substantial increases. So again, just to touch on what I, what I presented, so um, an increase of about 180% in our dependence on um, low carbon emitting resources as our primary uh, energy resource by 2050, that keeps us at that 3C mark. Um, if we want to try for the 2C mark, we're looking at anywhere from 275% increase in low carbon energy resources all the way up to 310%. So that's that's a, a pretty big difference, and that's happening, um, as I hopefully emphasized in the talk, over a very short time period. Those, those build-outs are, are looking at 2050, at least in terms of the numbers that I'm giving you. So that's 2050 isn't that far away, and that's a whole lot of infrastructure and development that would happen on the landscape in a, in a pretty rapid uh, rate. So uh, the various models I've seen uh, to get to 2050, uh, you know, the reductions of 2050 of uh, 80% emissions talk about uh, 300, anywhere from 330 to 440 gigawatts of land-based wind 
Uh, and that's compared to approximately 84 that we have now. So Dave, I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, there's the uncertainty associated with what's happening now. And then, of course, you know, increasing land-based wind alone by, you know, four or five fold. And so if you could speak to that. Sure, um, thanks David. And just so the audience knows, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on West and myself so you know the perspective that I sort of bring to this panel. Um, as Taylor mentioned, we, um, um, well, I moved to Wyoming in 92, but we started studying the uh, wind projects um, and wildlife interactions around 94, 95. Um, I was actually a field biologist working for the company and studying the Foot Big Grand Wind Project here west of Laramie um, back in the 90s. Um, so we, have, and, and for those of you who know West, um, understand we take a real scientific approach um, to addressing natural resource issues. Um, we don't advocate for the industry, we don't advocate for the agencies, we advocate for the science. We try to approach questions in a very scientific manner, um, designing good science to address the questions and try to answer those questions. And so, um, and due to our history with studying wind and wildlife, um, we sort of grew up with that industry uh, across the, the country. Um, and have been studying wind and wildlife interactions all across the nation, including Canada and through Latin America now. Um, and so we sort of been on a front line, uh, if you will, of addressing that uncertainty of what those impacts are at that kind of project scale. Um, we studied all kinds of interactions of different wildlife species, um, you know, birds and bats, um, even ungulates to a certain degree um, in, in different projects around the country. And so we have a lot of information, we've done a lot of work over time to address the uncertainty at the local scale or the project related scale. You know, what, is it, what are the impacts from a project? What are the impacts on sort of a per turbine basis? But more recently, as we started talking more and more about this issue with um, build out over time to address things like climate change, um, that means there's going to be a lot more wind, a lot more renewables going on the landscape. And so the question arises, well, what, what is, what's the uncertainty around that? There's sort of two levels of uncertainty, if you will. What's the uncertainty at the project level? What's the uncertainty related to, what are the impacts related to wind projects on wildlife? But the next level of uncertainty is that, what is that build-out? What's the impact of that build-out on, on wildlife across the country, um, across populations? And more recently, we've gotten involved in some studies that are looking at that, trying to address that question by understanding impacts um, at, at, a, at a project basis or a turbine basis scale um, and projecting that forward, you can get an idea of what you think might happen. Um, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty with that, um, but projecting those estimates forward over time, we can look at what we might think the overall impact is. And so we started looking at that. That question started coming up more and more and trying to address what those population level effects are. And so that's, um, it's, I think it's new, um, it's, it's relatively new. There's been a few public papers published, we've already heard, heard about some of them um, today that are looking at that question. Um, but there's a, but that uncertainty, I think, is kind of magnified at that level. When you start to think about, or there's a lot of different uncertainty, when you start to think about what the uncertainty is at a build-out level, have, do, those, do those projections, those impacts we understand at a per turbine basis or a, a small project basis, do those actually project forward? Um, and then maybe a lot of variability there um, based on the species or the, the ecosystem or the animals that you're actually looking at. And it may be more important to think about that for some species, as we mentioned, the ones that are, that are potentially critically imperiled just due to things like climate change um, and address those as opposed to just thinking about the wildlife and impacts to wildlife on a broader scale. So uh, when you started talking about you know, build out in the future, and uh, Allison, with your uh, the, the climate report, uh, your preparation for this panel reminded me that Dave sent out uh, a news brief that came out about uh, yes, woman cranes, and I wonder if you can it, it adds to this level of uncertainty. And, Amber, you might speak to this too, that species, the climate is, has been changing. Species are responding to changing climate. And how does that add to our uncertainty about 
uh, the future impacts of wind development? Well, from my, from my perspective, I think it's the thing that Amber was talking about um, in relation to how um, species respond. And I think it was was adaptive um, basket. Um, where animals, we, we, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. How are animals going to respond? And this particular article that, that Taylor was alluding to that I saw yesterday was related to whooping cranes and how they're delaying their starting their migration earlier um, in the spring to head back to Canada and delaying their migration south to later in the fall to come back to Texas. And so um, that that's sort of a almost a behavioral adaptation that's in response to, that may be in response to climate change. Um, and so there's there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that um, in what we're seeing with um, with animals. Um, another one that I know there's it's gotten some speculative talk about is with bats. Um, a lot of the work I do actually on project basis is with Endangered Species Act compliance. And we worked on um, um, developing applications for install take permits for endangered bats for wind projects. And one of the things we, we're concerned about is addressing climate change. And what is the effect um, on bat populations from climate change, but also on their um, annual cycle? We know that, we, as Amanda talked about, we've learned a lot over the years about the impacts to bats from wind, and when that happens. And there's sort of an annual cycle associated with that. But as climate change may change the behavior of these animals, um, they may emerge from hibernation earlier. They may stay out later. Um, like whooping cranes have, you know, what does that do to our impact assessment? What is that? What is that? How do we uh, account for that and the uncertainty? Do we, do we know the full picture now? And understanding that the full picture might be changing over time. So I would just add to that a little bit in that um, I think all this signals that there's a really strong place for continued science and continued research as we move forward and trying to under understand somewhat simultaneously, what are the, the effects of, of increased wind power on the landscape, coupled with, you know, at the same time, the climate's getting warmer, and how are species responding to those changes? So I think, you know, as, as you think about your organization's role or perspective or engagement with renewable energy discussions, it's worth giving some thought to, you know, where can we continue to build some of these research ideas? Where can we have space to be learning more about what's going on, because I really think that in some cases, at least in the world of adaptive capacity, we're at the forefront of our understanding in terms of, of animals' ability to adapt. And the more information we can get about that, the better our projections are going to be, and the better we'll be able to understand these relationships in the future. So, uh, talking about research, reducing uncertainty. Let's talk about adaptive management. You know, Allison, this is a subject near and dear to your heart. And um, so how can we more effectively use adaptive management uh, as a tool to both address these uncertainties, learn as we develop, uh, and uh, reduce the uncertainty and the effects that has on you know, the pace and scale of renewable energy development and what we intend as the reduction in carbon emissions. So yeah, I, I'd like, actually like everybody to speak to this, but Allison, if you could go first. And uh, you could, if you could talk about you know, what you think adaptive management means so everybody understands where we're all coming from. And then part of this conversation is considering what are the challenges that adaptive management presents uh, to uh, project development, operation, and finances, uh, and uh, how we can uh, design an adaptive management regime that takes all of that into account. Sure. Um, adaptive, adaptive management is one of my favorite topics. Um, Tabor, I think you hit on it in your presentation at the end. I think the first thing that we really have to look at is more of a, um, I don't want to use the word collaborative, but coordinated management and conservation. Um, I think the conservation community as well as, you know, um, the development community, we're taking a death by a thousand cuts. And that's 
partially because we all have things going on, we're all working on different projects, we're all collecting data, but where is uh, that one space that we can start kind of accumulating this data and making it available and, and having more of a, a resource bank for it rather than having to go hunt for it? I know that's a very big ask. I know that's not an easy thing to pull off. It's something that Audubon is very engaged in with this um, in the Sagebrush ecosystem right now. It's trying to how do we pull that together? That's number one. I think that we have to kind of get ourselves together and, or, or start wrapping our brains around that of how we are going to coordinate better. And the reason why I distinguish coordinate from collaboration is collaboration sometimes um, has the has this feeling of, well, you're going to change your mind in, in your mission and your goals of your agency or organization. Where coordinate is we all are talking to one another to tell each other what we're doing. Um, and that, I, I realize that's very hard, but I think that's something that we all need to think about very hard um, and how we're going to pull that off. It would make life easier down the road. Um, and then second, in that kind of death by a thousand cuts, each wind farm project, each project, science project that Audubon's doing, or TNC, or you know, an agency project, um, they're very individualized, right? And even our NEPA process, our federal regulations, emphasize that. And for a reason, I get it. Um, you know, each project has an environmental impact statement. We have to go through that. We have to figure out on a local level what the impacts are going to be. Where I think we're missing and where I think we need to expand is taking that to the whole more holistic look at things. So we're looking at project by project by project by project. So how do we expand that into the impacts on a region, the impacts on a landscape, the impacts nationally, and start gathering that information as well. I think that's critical because we are suffering death by a thousand cuts right now. As far as, and then that rolls into our adaptive management. I don't think, and this is kind of my personal, I won't say it's national headlines policy or anything, but I don't think adaptive management is ever really employed correctly. I think we have, we all have kind of a different take on adaptive management and what that means. Um, and it's very hard to carry out, I realize that as well, but I think we have all collectively kind of missed the boat. The way, when I think of adaptive management, is it's very uh, uh, circular. You know, it's, it's a cyclical cycle that never stops. And I think the stopping point is where we are. We do an impact statement. We do a research project. We find the results. Huh. All right. And we stop there. It is a constant circle of, OK, what did we learn? How do we change our trajectory? How do we, you know, mitigation, did it work, did it not? It should always kind of change the way we're thinking and move forward. And then we test that and go back around and back around and back around. We're missing that cycle. We're missing that way of doing, implementing, you know, finding out the implications, changing our trajectory if necessary, and going back around and testing that. We stop in that cycle. We all do in all of our, you know, we, we've done the project, you know, we've collected the data, move on to the next one. And then that misses a holistic effort of, okay, what have we learned from this? How can we pull it out of that very specific site management research or project and apply it to the landscape? We know a lot right now, one, and there will always be a level of uncertainty. We have to move forward. I think we all realize that. But we have to move forward in a very more directed manner and knowing that things, as we learn things, we will have to change. Which brings me to my next point in that fiscal responsibility, right? So we have this adaptive management and I think everyone's, um, and rightfully so, there's, there's an issue with the bottom line, especially when it comes to the wind development companies. They have a fiscal bottom line that they have to meet. If we're constantly changing and adapting and changing, you know, the ways they have to mitigate, yada, 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 how does that affect their bottom line? 
on a site-by-site -site project, the way I see it is they may not be able to change. You know, we, we have to be cognizant of that issue. We have to be cognizant of if it's not going to be a profit margin that they can accept, then they're not going to do it, and then we're back to square one, right? We're back to a, you know, a non-renewable resource. But as we research, as we learn, as we adopt, we need to pull the things that we learn and apply them to the next project or to the next landscape. And we're not, we're not exactly doing that right now. We're just, we're banking on, well, what do we learn or what are we doing on this one site? We're going to apply it to this one site. And, you know, maybe we're not taking that more holistic approach. So it's not necessarily, although I think there should be some foresight into, okay, you're going to do this research project. It may turn out that you want, you need to change some things. You might want to fiscally kind of count, count that in in the beginning, which I know is hard. But also, how is that going to influence our research, our monitoring, and our development as we move forward across the nation, not just one wind site, wind development project in Wyoming or in Colorado, wherever you are. So that's my, that's my share. Sure, I'll just follow that, and I think I'll be pretty brief because basically what I want to say is, yeah, what she said. I mean, really, that is absolutely true. I think that the concept of adaptive management, and, and I also am speaking somewhat more personally, or at least locally, on behalf of the Sierra Club now than, than a national perspective, but from my perspective, it, it makes all the sense in the world uh, but it has to be that kind of circular process that's continually ongoing that Allison just described to actually be really meaningful. And I think that sometimes in, in some, some of my colleagues are a little bit, they want to keep adaptive management a little bit at arm's length because it's seen as a sort of a screen almost that allows projects to go forward and allays immediate concerns with this idea that we're going to follow adaptive management and we're going to learn and we're going to apply what we learn to make it better. But that doesn't actually necessarily happen. And so and until we can make that a more continuous process, it really isn't meaningful. And, and that's really just absolutely where uh, where we need to go, and and I also really appreciate your comments, Allison, about the just coordinating all of the work that's done because I'm not an expert in all of this stuff by any stretch. I read what I can read, and I keep as up to date as I can, and I'm never there. But um, if if all of this work were more coordinated and more easily accessible. Um, that would benefit all of us, I think, and would help us move towards a more meaningful application of adaptive management where we could learn what we use. And I, I include weaving that into the projects that are, that are on the table that will be developed and that we want to see some of those projects developed where they make sense. Um, we need to be able to learn from them and apply what we learn continuously to every other new project that's coming a year or two or three from now. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my take. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, um, I completely agree. I think adaptive management is a tool that um, we're not using to its full extent. Um, that, that we could, be, could use it. When I think about adaptive management, I think, well, what does that mean? And management, you know, we're trying to manage the project, we're trying to manage a species, maybe we're trying to manage an ecosystem or um, a region or, or something. You know, there's a lot of different things that can be adaptively managed. But one way to think about adaptive management is to think about, well, you want to manage a system to, or whatever you're trying to manage to reach some goals or objectives. And so you can think about um, putting up several competing hypotheses about ways to go about getting to that end goal, or what your end goal is. And maybe that's reduced fat mortality, maybe that's reduced eagle mortality, maybe that's, um, you know, maximize your energy production while you minimize eagle mortality, something like that. So, um, and then you, then you go about doing your studies or your research and you pick, 
you know, the, um, the outcome of those different competing, but different treatments, so to speak, against each other, to which one of those treatments best reaches or best meets that goal or objective. Um, and, and we don't often use it that way at all. We don't. And I work in a world where, um, you know, like Endangered Species Act compliance, um, writing um, applications for incidental take permits, we often call these habitat conservation plans. Um, there's an adaptive management component to that, but in so many cases, it's, not, it's nothing more than a contingency plan. You know, if this happens, you will do this in the story. And, and we kind of get forced into that boat because um, instead of keeping it a little more broad and a little more research oriented or allowing you to change in the future because of the regulations, the requirements around um, the Fish and Wildlife Service issuing those permits and, and having to have uh, a public comment period on that. So the public needs to know what you're proposing and the position that the, the service will stand. And, and so um, before you go, so if you leave it sort of open-ended, we're going to do a research study to figure out how to manage the project to maximize energy production but minimize bat mortality, then that's not enough detail. And so we end up making these elaborate contingency plans sometimes to go into those applications. And that's, in my opinion, not the best way of thinking about it. So Dave, also if you could speak, because so you've done a lot of work with developers and you know, as I think we've talked in other contexts a wind energy facility is a power plant. That's why it's built. It's not a scientific research project or study site. So can you talk about the challenges? Because what adaptive management implies is that we're going to continue to uh, collect information at a project and learn in the context of some organized approach. We're going to keep learning. And so what are the challenges associated that, that you're seeing with trying to do that kind of applied research uh, at a wind facility? Yeah, there certainly are a lot of challenges. Um, um, as you said, it's a, there, these are industrial facilities that um, are designed to produce energy. Um, and so they have side effect, of course, uh, as everything does. There's no such thing as a free lunch, of course. Um, and so um, balancing that or um, you know, having that, um, that industrial facility work towards um, sort of minimizing those impacts, if you will, uh, of, of minimizing the, uh, the effects that, that that facility is having is a challenge, of course. Um, there's certain things um, out there that may end up um, regulating a facility in a de facto manner. I mean, the world I live in, and, and from a project perspective, I already talked about a few times, and, Endangered Species Act compliance is, um, you know, a lot of projects um, have a risk of taking an endangered species. And so the way that can be in compliance with the law is to seek an incidental take permit. Um, and um, within that um, context, um, they're, you know, they're trying to maximize their energy production to meet their goals and objectives, but they also have to, there's a trade off there, they also have to minimize their impact on the, on the resource. Of the endangered species that's potentially taken, and also mitigate for that. And so, um, in those scenarios, when projects are going down there, there may be a number of there may be a little more latitude because of the federal agency involvement to actually require studies to actually to do some sort of research related to that um, that issue of potential take of endangered species um, that allows them that allows us to sort of answer those questions. But in a lot of cases where there's not a, um, a risk of take, or the, or the risk is, is unlikely. I mean, the threshold in the Endangered Species Act is, are you likely to take um, an endangered species? And if you are likely to take it, then the appropriate path is to seek an incidental take permit. Um, but there's a lot of projects, as, and as Taper mentioned earlier, with eagles that are not likely to result in take of endangered species or of eagles. And so those projects, um, you know, there's not a, there's not an overlying governing body that's actually requiring them to, to do additional studies or to adaptively manage or to um, address these things on a, on a regulatory basis. You know, the service doesn't have regulatory authority over building a wind project or managing that wind project. What they have regulatory authority over is of taking endangered species. And so they can provide that take coverage if that project is likely to result in a take, but they can't 
they, they're not allowed to sort of regulate the project um, in a manner. I don't know if that gets your question, David, or did they just start rambling? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how, yeah, it's, it's hard to get an answer. Uh, so we're going to ask open up uh, to the audience for questions in a few minutes. But uh, what you know, if if we have a vision of where we want to be uh, in the future, let's say 2050, uh, we've talked about this question of uncertainty, uh, how we uh, manage this uncertainty. Uh, but what do you see as as steps that we can take now to help us uh, deal with this or address and potentially solve this uh, question that people come from from a variety of perspectives of, of managing uncertainty and, and perhaps coming to accept a certain level of uncertainty in order to achieve a larger goal. And I guess, Ember, I'd like to hear from you first because you know you're in the climate realm, as it were, so uh, as opposed to you know, many of us that are working directly in wind and wildlife, so you could speak to that. Sure, so I think one of the big challenges, and honestly this isn't unique to climate, but one of the, the big challenges I'll speak to is the idea of presenting uncertainty to audiences that don't spend a lot of time thinking about uncertainty and particularly non-scientific capacity. So so we, we live in kind of a soundbite world, at least in terms of media engagement. And I think a lot of people maybe perceive that science is going to give you an answer. And that's the answer you're going to have and it's going to be right. And it's right today and it's right tomorrow and it's right 50 years from now. Well if that were true, we wouldn't have made half of the medical, 90% of the medical advances that we've made in, in, in modern you know, human health alone. So I think figuring out a way to, to talk about uncertainty, and maybe that means, you know, partnering with organizations that have sort of a, a public communication strategy component, but figuring out how we can language uncertainty with the normal public in a way that makes sense and helps people to be a little bit more comfortable with that idea. I think that's, I think that's sort of the, one, one of the first things. And then when it comes to climate change, Climate change can be a tough subject. Um, for whatever reason, it has become a very politicized subject, particularly in areas where um, a, a lot of the income for a state or for an organization comes from the extractive industry. So I think figuring out ways to talk about climate change in a way that makes sense to the, the people that you're working with is also really important. And sometimes that means talking about climate variability in the place of climate change and emphasizing those observed trends that we've seen, maybe not thinking quite so much about the role of future projections, because you begin to wrap uncertainty into that and it begins to become a little bit more difficult for folks to kind of um, wrap their heads around. So, so I think languaging is a, is a really big component. Um, I totally agree. That was a really good point as far as you know the, the communications and the language, especially with the public at large. Um, I think from a, a conservation community, and, and I think Connie's, or, you know, spoke to it. I speak to it. Um, we have a tendency when we look at our impacts of wildlife to kind of put the brakes on, like, ah, you know, the whooping cranes are migrating ten days early both directions, and, and by the way, that's just not whooping cranes, as we're seeing that in a lot of our neotropical migrant species as well. We're seeing earlier takeoffs, earlier comebacks, um, or earlier comebacks, which is, you know, a problem when it comes to migration of birds. Um, and realizing, like I said earlier, there's always a level of uncertainty. You're exactly right. With the science, you know, can tell you what we know today. That's going to change, you know, next year, possibly in 50 years, um, quite possibly. And coming to grips with that ourselves in the community and saying, okay, how can we move forward? What are the best ways that we can move forward? So in, you know, 2050, as far as you know, what we need to be doing, we're going to go back to that not collaborative but collective conservation, really talking to one another, getting on the same page, 
and stop the polarization and coming to the table and saying, okay, this is the information, this is how we're going to move forward from all sides. And looking more holistically at the landscape. We are so project focused, which I know we have to be to, to delineate impacts on a very site specific scale, but we have to bring our heads up a little bit and look more holistically. I also think about our federal NEPA process as well, and that's fighting off an elephant. I get it. Um, but we have to eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? We have stayed in our lanes. I think we all are running under a system that has been in place for a very long time, and how do we navigate within this system? How do we you know, work within that EIS uh, system? Stay in your lane. I think we need to get out of our lanes. I think we need to think about this is a, you know, the NEPA process is necessary, it is very good, but how can we improve it given our circumstances today? How do we look at that and say, okay, this is a good, this is a good place to be, we need it, but we need to bring our heads up, we need to look holistically, we need to improve that process as well. And that's turning a cruise ship, I get it, but um, we have to start thinking that way. Um, yeah, I guess I would uh, also concur with both Amber and Allison that it really is uh, a, a huge chunk of this is about communication and how we um, talk about these issues. And it's interesting when I talk about these issues to almost anybody, how often I say, well, it's complicated. <laughs> Well, I can't, it's not really one or the other. It, you know, and I mean, that's just because it is. It really is, and yet, collectively, outside of a sort of select setting like this, but in the general public, it's, things are really black and white. And that's what a lot of people are really comfortable with. And if there isn't a black or white answer, it's, there's not much conversation or discussion that, that ensues and so I think that is one of our biggest challenges is is how to um, really convey the complexity of this of this whole huge topic uh, without uh, and, and keep the conversation and discussion even going and then secondly it is also that looking at the big picture and for us in my organization, it really is the greater threat overshadows and really informs the decisions that we make about everything else, the greater threat to climate change and all of its many impacts. And, and as I started out by saying, not just to wildlife, but to everything that we do and care about. And so um, I think that we, we have to continue to find ways to discuss this that, that really broaden and deepen the discussion and um, uh, I guess within that context, do our best to move forward. The other thing I would just say really briefly is that for me personally, this is a really scary topic because I don't know the answers. I don't know what the long-term cumulative landscape level national level impacts of robust wind development really will be on all sorts of things that I care about. But I feel that we're at a point where we have to go forward and do our best. And so that's pretty much where we, um, what we're trying to do, I guess, all of us here right now. Yes, I agree. There's no such thing as a black and white world when you're studying wildlife. Um, it's all with shades of gray. Um, some are areas, there's so much variation across space and time, and we're seeing changes in that. Um, but I do, uh, I do believe science is a good way to take one bite of the elephant at a time. Um, you know, you ask the right question, you do, as Chad said, there's, we're starting to get some replication when we're looking at um, prairie grouse. We're starting to see similar trends in different species of prairie grouse. That's part of the scientific process to say, all right, we're starting to narrow down that big gray scale. Like, here's what the answer is. Here's what the answer is most of the time. And when we get to there, how much how much certainty do we need to know to get to before we can say, all right, we're okay with this level of impact. 
Because we know, for example, sage grouse aren't going to blink off the face of the earth if we build out wind. We don't know that yet, I don't think. We don't have the answer to that. But the science is a way to take those little bites one at a time to help us get to that, get to those answers. Well, great. Thank you. And I think now we'll open up the floor to questions. Uh, you can direct them to all the panelists or one in particular. There's a word that I haven't heard very much of during this, these discussions, and that's conservation. <clears throat> I look around, I might be the oldest person here, I turned 80 in June, and I graduated from high school in 1955, and the population of the United States is 155 million. The population of the United States today is 311 million, so it's doubled in my lifetime, and my hope I keep on living, I hope my lifetime isn't dying. But uh, I, uh, I also know that during that same time, the capita use of energy has doubled, and we're living and having this conversation in the state that uses the most per capita energy. So uh, I would like to uh, ask, where's conservation in all this? I know that in, my, in the last 10 years, I've reduced my consumption of energy to about half. The solar panels all over my house, and an electric car, and uh, I would like to just ask, how many of you have reduced your consumption of energy? And that word, conservation, has been left out. Uh, could you address that? I'll start. That's a very good point, actually. Um, you know, conservation is a way to address uncertainty as well. Um, you know, we're talking about uncertainty with what the future looks like. Um, you know, um, providing mitigation for wildlife is one way to address that uncertainty. We don't know what the true impact may be to a species, but by providing a conservation benefit, some mitigation um, on one side, that's one way to help offset impacts and offset some of the, the variation in the impacts we have. Um, as far as conservation on an individual um, basis, um, I agree completely. That's another very, very important uh, component to start to reduce our energy consumption, which may help address the, you know, the, the, four, the 4C if we don't have to build out to 325% of what we're built out now because of conservation. It helps lower that bar some. Um, I would just add to that that I think that's a great question, Dwayne, and I'm glad you brought it up. I actually noticed in all the sessions yesterday that I heard energy efficiency mentioned once in passing as the cheapest new source of, of energy that we have available to us right now. But that aside, let's talk about wind and everything else. And I, I actually think that is a huge error. I think that we should really be focused on how we use energy as the first step of any ensuing conversation about anything that has to do with this topic. And I think that there is a tremendous opportunity right here in Wyoming if we chose to take it to develop state policies that really promoted more efficient use of energy efficiency of energy and could well provide us with some tremendous um, economic diversification opportunities in this state as well. So that's kind of a different conversation, but it shouldn't really be different. It should be part of this whole conversation of this forum. So thanks. Yeah, it's not as much a question as more of a comment because some of you have nailed exactly the conundrum that I feel I'm in. I'm a field grunt. I do all that collection of data. I've been on the site now for three years and it has gotten under my skin. Um, I love it. Um, I've spent hours looking for eagles. I, I almost have made this with foxes. Um, and it's, it's my area. And so I have this extreme sadness to know that it's all going to go um, or to be changed. Even if, even if some of the wildlife aren't impacted, that essence of wildness will be forever gone. 
Um, and so how you weigh that, but it's an opportunity. I, I told myself it's a great opportunity. This is remote, undeveloped prairie just waiting for a research project to do pre and post. And I don't know how to make that happen. And if there's any suggestions or anyone in this room who can approach me afterwards and say, I have an idea on how to make that happen. Because Dave, I think you're right, you know, how do you get a company, I mean, where's the money from to support that kind of a research project? But when I see the opportunity for research, I think something good could come from this. Um, I just don't know how to get the ball rolling. I can just respond to that briefly. And first thing, thank you for being the person in the field collecting data. That's None of us could do what we do without people like you in the field. Um, and the second thing I would add is, is it was a comment that um, I shared with someone earlier, and that's that there's a lot of change happening on the landscape, and, and change to our favorite places is really difficult. But it's also one of the most exciting times to be a biologist because we do get to see and understand how species respond to change and how new dynamics can play out in a way that, that we maybe haven't been able to, to observe it before. So, just a couple thoughts. Actually, it's a question and comment. Um, so, to kind of follow up with this gentleman over here, you know, we in Wyoming talk about our energy dependency. We definitely talk a lot about, you know, what we do when it comes to our wind resources and our natural resource extraction. But we don't talk about the individual resident. We don't talk about how we, as an individual who owns a home here, could probably be a part of that conversation. Solar panels, smaller wind turbines on our personal facilities. Or why aren't we having a conversation about when we build new, new facilities, new build outs? What is the green energy cost for that? Why wouldn't we put green energy into those new production facilities? Like, for example, when we're, we're building a brand new um, housing development, why are we having those conversations? We're losing our landscapes every time we put a huge build out out there. And it's a sensitive landscape, whether it be the wildlife, the cultural resources, or just a view shed alone. And these are the conversations that we need to start at that state level. And this is a great panel. I think it's wonderful. It was a great conversation. But I think that we need to start to dig in and figure out what those values are and how to start localizing our energy resources and then build out. Thank you. I thought I'd just bring up a couple of topics to see if any of you would like to respond. Um, one of them in terms of um, managing uncertainty. Uh, what TNC has been doing to try to be proactive about this is incorporate um, systems thinking, the systems theory more into how we look at these connected whole systems, habitats, ecosystems, and how to manage within them. And we're looking at things like complexity, science, and what that means for how leaders in like organizations like mine kind of make decisions in terms of different kinds of domains. If it's a simple situation, if it's complicated, or if it's chaotic, um, what does that kind of imply for how a manager should see the world? Um, wondering if your organizations have incorporated any of that kind of thinking in terms of how you, you lead your organizations. And secondly, in terms of climate change, one thing we haven't discussed yet is the impact projected uh, on the resource itself. And I know there are various studies that are indicating that um, climate change impacts could include a change in the distribution of the wind resource itself. Also, changes in the annual variability of that resource, even some indications that the overall intensity of wind could decrease worldwide. Maybe we could hear more from the industry itself in terms of how they're thinking about their need to adapt to those kinds of climate change projected changes. But do you have any responses to both of those issues? To the, I'm not sure I do, but um, we, uh, I'm not part of the industry, so I, that's the interesting thought you brought up about how does climate change affect the wind resource and where the future is, of where the wind projects might be. And I know I work a lot with industry, but I don't think I've ever had that conversation with um, any of my developers that I work for. I might, might have to ask them that. 
just the same that they said. You know, that's an interesting, um, I've heard that before, but I haven't heard anyone addressing it as far as from, and maybe there's a developer in the room that could address that question. Um, as far as your first question on, um, you know, thinking about how we build out and, and Audubon is thinking about that and, and working with partners uh, like TNC to think about, okay, how do we build it out? How do we look at that, that structure as well from our, from our national science team as well? Actually, I'm sorry, I'm just going to respond to that too. I, I think maybe not calling it by that name, but related to what you talked about, systems thinking and complexity science, to do the work we did on um, developing models for additional mitigation options or offset options for eagles, there was a recognition that a lot of the information that we'd like to have didn't exist. And so how do we, how do we deal with that when we're trying to make decisions, we don't have all the, the information we need. Land, you know, wildlife managers are making those kinds of judgments all the time. And I think one of the things that we did was basically, and this was with a team, was first of all, being transparent about it. Transparent about how we managed uncertainty and how we addressed uncertainty in our, in our decision making. And the other was to use expert judgment. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge and experience in the wildlife community and there are techniques for extracting that information in, in an organized and relatively unbiased way and turn that experience and judgment into data. And so our, the models that we created, for example, for the vehicle collision model, uh, we used expert elicitation to get expert judgment and create uh, basically, you know, a model and then parameters for the variables in that model. Uh, and recognizing that the model is not the answer, but it provides a framework, a, a structured hypothesis, if you will, for where we need additional information, where uh, the information, where we should focus our research, and that that information will provide the greatest return. Uh, on understanding the system. And so, you know, we, we've done it. It's still in the early stages of, uh, you know, how successful have we been uh, in doing this. But I think as a broader path forward for trying to get at some of these questions where we don't have the data that we would like to have is, is a path forward, too. I'm a resident of Carbon County, been on the Saratoga and Camp Rollins Conservation District Board for 27 years, and resources are bailiwick. I realize I'm in a large congregation of academia and science right here, but I'm surprised you didn't drag old Al Gore over here to tell us what a terrible shape the world is in. Um, I have some disputes with some of the theories that are espoused here. Um, for one thing, you say there's no emissions from wind turbines and the structures and the power lines. There are. A big one is uh, ozone. Another big one is the CO2 associated with manufactured steel and concrete. There's, a, in some of the big terms, there's over 200 tons of steel. It takes roughly a ton of coal and, and the coke coal and, and the heating and the manufacture of uh, of steel and concrete. So you need to study those emissions and, and trade them against what you're espousing as being the answer to the world's problem with CO2 emissions, basis of life, CO2, CO2, O2, that transaction, that's a scientific fact. Um, as a rancher and an agriculturalist, I am not willing to sacrifice the open space and the wildlife resource that we have on a theory that you're going to reduce the temperature of the earth. 
It's a fact. I represent a lot of blue collar people who just out there busting their butt, like to go hunting and fishing and enjoy the scenery, live in Wyoming and put up with the climate for that exact opportunity to do what they want with their open spaces. Um, we have a lot of scientists that contribute to the dead forest now. We try to tell them different then would listen to us. I think it's time you maybe pay attention to some of the people that got common sense. I debated Andy Burke one time about climate change. There's more confidence in Al Gore, the noticed scientist, than there is in God Almighty, I guess. That's simplifying it a little bit, but climate's changed cyclically since the time of Earth's creation. It's verified. The sun is a, a, a nuclear power source for our entire universe. It pulses, it relapses, and uh, climate change is basically driven by the sun's impact upon water and, and air and soil and planet Earth. Try that for a theory. Thank you. just uh, speak to a point made earlier when I was talking about emissions because I was the one who made that comment I was talking about the production of electricity your as electricity is being produced I think your point about the life cycle emissions associated with wind energy development is well taken My name is Jay Lillagraven. My friends refer to me as the Ogre. <laughs> and um, I, I was really intrigued by the Sierra Club's perspective on um, renewable energy above all else, including perhaps preservation of species uh, in the short term. And uh, I wonder to what extent that perspective would be would be tolerated. Uh, for for example, uh, you, we could eliminate many of the uh, uh, in, inhibitions to developing renewable resources by um, softening the requirements for a permit application for the approval of that permit application as through the Industrial Siting Council, for example. And I guess I'll ask Connie uh, to say to what degree would you agree with the uh, ease and perhaps the efficacy or even the appropriateness of uh, softening the requirements? I think, um, thanks for the question, Jay, I guess. <laughs> um, and I think that the best way I can answer that is to say that we don't um, advocate softening uh, requirements or regulations that are designed to ensure that projects are done responsibly and uh, with, uh, in, a, in a way that could minimize impacts I mean, we all have acknowledged that impacts will occur from really any industrial development and renewables, large-scale renewables are another type of industrial development that confer impacts. So our task, we believe, is to, is to make sure that as we're moving to develop renewables, we do it in a manner that um, minimizes the impacts to the greatest extent possible that avoids them where we can and where the impacts are, are, are simply too high and that minimizes them in every way that we, that we can. That's our, our responsibility, but we uh, don't believe that because there are impacts and there's a great deal of uncertainty about exactly how high those impacts are that we shouldn't go forward in a blanket way. With uh, that, that we should 
reject in a blanket way, I guess, the development of, of renewables and wind in particular. And that includes the regulations that are designed through the industrial siting process as well as all the other uh, permitting processes that exist. So I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but I think maybe it does. We'll take one more question in the back of the room. So I'm not sure if this panel can answer it, but there might be somebody in the room. We've talked about adaptive management and the design features of a lot of these wind turbines is changing, and especially in Europe and other countries. And we still have, we haven't talked about different types of um, wind turbine generators out there. Does anyone have research or an opinion on some of the other designs that other countries are looking at? This didn't come up yesterday, and somebody in the audience spoke to it. Was it you? Yeah. Is just getting the same question as asked. So basically, I mean, you can imagine, especially since um, the early 2000s, uh, there's been a lot of different OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, that have put a lot of money and effort into trying to perfect the lowest cost, you know, best winter they possibly can. And everybody, at least today, as far as it can be seen, it's a three blade uplink turbine. That's what optimizes out for the lowest cost. There are things like the drivetrain itself, whether a machine should have a gearbox or not. Truck 5050 now has been a move in the last 10 years to permanent magnet direct drive, like the Goldwyn machine, and there are others um, that have that kind of topo uh, topography and turbo architecture for the machine. Um, and things like how do you actuate the pitch system that actually controls the blades um, in turn. It's roughly 5050 again for hydraulically controlled which you know, has its pluses and minuses, and then there's electrically driven um, with variable speed motors and a bolt gear and a ring gear that, that's at the base of each blade that actually operates and pitches those blades during operation. So are there other uh, technologies out there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's some vertical axis, uh, but they're typically much smaller. There's uh, Golov rotors and some of these kinds of concepts that can be used more in an architectural setting, again, in those smaller machines. Um, there's a style of the Seattle branches that might be 10 kilowatt size, and you know, it's enough to power the ranch or to provide for backup if the grid goes down. Um, but when you talk about utility scale wind power, it's those large three-bladed upwind um, oriented machines that always pencil out with the lowest cost of energy and the highest production. So I elaborated a little more than I did yesterday, but that's the, um, my influence really by the way. A professor of practice here, so I, I did work for General Electric, and actually from 2002 to 2009 was part of the growth of that business where we looked at exactly this kind of stuff. What is the, you know, the equipment that would be used to make the lowest cost but the highest amount of energy out? Thank you. This panel has tackled some really tough content, so please help me thank them for taking it on. Um, we'll reconvene at 1 o'clock uh, for the next panel.